Okay, good afternoon everyone. Hope you're doing well. Uh, so my name is Jonathan Ellis. I'm the Managing Director of Send Alpha Capital uh, and today we'll be talking about fundraising best practices and how to raise money from out-of-town investors. Uh, if you're joining us in Twin Cities Startup Week, thanks for joining us. Um, hope you're having a great great week so far or month I guess it is this time. Uh, I was actually there in person the last few. I was hanging around last, last uh, year for the, even the weekend. It was a great time. Um, so delighted to be part of it this time around. And if you're joining us in Midwest Tech Connect, hope you're having a good week there as well. Um, so we've got a lot to cover. Just a, uh, oops, excuse me. A quick intro here. Um, so quick thing about me. Um, so uh, run Sun Alpha Capital now for four years full time. Uh, I have a, an investing background. Uh, between 2014 and 2016, I started making some um, in angel investments. Anything from a small amount of uh, you know angel list type investments to sort of some bigger offline checks here in Chicago. Um, raised a, a fund with no track record as a VC. I didn't really have an angel track record to point to. It was early days, and obviously through angel list and things, you don't really get credit for sourcing things. Uh, we made 24 investments, and um, the uh, most recently we started Midwest Tech Connect. So that was a uh, an idea to get start startups and investors from really across the Midwest region together. So looked at a ton of deals, hopefully can relay some things I've learned and things I've come across along the way. Uh, just some of our portfolio companies there as well. So Kin just raised a $35 million Series B, Logic Gate just raised a $25 million Series B. Um, others are far along. We've got some folks that raised locally, some folks that raised uh, from coastal investors. I've got a uh, question here from Andreas. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll make a recording available. Uh, if you want to stick around and ask questions, uh, though, that would be great. Uh, ask you some questions in advance. We basically built this whole deck uh, last night in response to all of your, your sort of pre-questions. So we'll try and get through it all, address sort of as much as we can along the way, just to make sure we're hitting everything. Um, but obviously keep the questions coming, coming as well. I've got, I've got the questions open here. Uh, so you're all seemingly almost all first-time founders is a, a, a sort of a real range. So some of you are very pre-seed stage, some of you are further along, uh, all sorts of sectors. So I'll try and talk generally. I probably have a bit of a bias towards like software marketplaces, tech-enabled services and things like that versus sort of hard tech, but um, a lot of this will be relevant. Um, and yeah, please use the, the Q&A box uh, for questions. Not, that'll help me keep on top of things. Um, so in terms of what we'll talk about, I'm just going to touch on some fundraising fundamentals, just as some of you are, are pretty new to this. Uh, I'll try and make that sort of 10 minutes. Then we'll get into the best practices around sort of both preparation and then the process to kind of have a good fundraising outcome. So this, this slide is uh, one that I put together a while back, so sorry if it's a little blurry, but um, it just gives you a, a sense of, I guess, how people sort of try and classify the different stages. Um, so it used to be that Series A was the first VC round and then seed got created and then now people are at pre-seed. Um, and all that's really happening is people are sort of renaming the same things. But it's really um, all about where you are in terms of the stage of your company, how much you've really proven out already and what people have to go off of in terms of investing. So that'll dictate uh, how much confidence they have in what you're doing, um, how much evidence there is of your ability to execute. So at pre-seed stages, people are really looking at what they call the team and the dream. So, you know, who are you assembling? What's the vision? And then those very early indications of, of you know, what you're actually doing. So like your MVP and things like that. Um, more further along, now you need to, you know, the bar has gone up now. You need to, if you're raising more money at high valuation, you need to sort of demonstrate some early product market fit. The product's got to be better. You've got to have some happy customers people can talk to. And then as things get further and further along then, you know, there'll be more expectation that you have good metrics or improving metrics, at least a story around those and things should be fleshed out a little more. So pre-seed, typically the smallest rounds uh, up to sort of three quarters of a million, maybe a million at the high end, million to two, uh, three million or so uh, for seed. And then series A, it starts to really depend on the business, right? How, you know, how far along are you? What, what's the opportunity in front of you? And we've seen portfolio companies raise anything from you know, four million to 15 million. Um, at Series A. Um, and each stage, it's sort of six to 18 months is, is sort of typically how it works. So you want enough time, you close the, the funding, you've been able to execute and move along a little bit, and then, you know, hopefully hit the milestones for the, the, for the next raise. So 
fundraising takes time, execution takes time, and so that's how it sort of phases out. Um, it's just another way to think about it. So on the left, you know, that early stage where you're still figuring things out, that's when you're your founder capital, your friends and family capital, pre-seed, which is sort of a very early stage VCs and angels. And then as you, you know, get further along in terms of validating what you're doing, the seed will sort of open up to you. And once you sort of have something which is a little bit more, you know, scalable, replicable, then Series A will come in and then you can really sort of, um, you know, unlock, unlock your growth from there. So what, what, you know, what are people really assessing when, when they're talking about that, right? So there's a lot of different dimensions to your business. So, you know, how far are you, are you along in terms of product development? You know, if you're technical founders, you might have a really, really good product, but not have much else to show for it yet. And that's okay, you know, that, that'll be your relative strength. Um, early signals of product market fit. You know, we've invested pre-revenue, but in companies that had, uh, you know, built a wait list even, or had some you know, enterprise customers in the, the very late stages of the pipeline. So there's things to look at that signaled that there was demand for what they were doing, even though there wasn't actually sort of revenue there yet. Um, and so the more revenue visibility you can create, the more, uh, you know, pipeline or momentum or leads and, you know, signs that there's more to come uh, will help you. Um, people are trying to assess unit economics. So very early on, very hard to tell. But the idea is, you know, for every dollar that is being invested in either sort of, you know, overhead or products, you know, what's that going to translate into in terms of um, value for the customers over the longer term? But really, like customer acquisition, you know, people talk about CAC, the customer acquisition costs versus the lifetime value of the customer. What does that look like? What, what do people think that'll look like? And then um, the more you are developed in terms of, uh, you know, the team, you have a strong team, grid expertise, domain expertise, technical expertise. Um, if you seem to be working closely together, these are all sort of relative strengths or weaknesses. And over time, the more of that comes together, the more conviction investors will have, and then the easier it'll be to, to raise that round and then move on to the next one. Um, so there are very few hard rules. People that invest sort of post revenue will make exceptions if everything else is really good except revenue. Um, and so you just you know got to think about you know who you're pitching and you know, where are you at and what are your relative strengths. So you know, what can you really uh, lean on in the sale and like admit your weaknesses and like ask for help with those, um, and obviously just keep striving to improve on all fronts. So how much to raise? I uh, get this question a lot. Um, historically, people guided, you know, you should raise 12 to 18 months of runway. Now, runway, you know, you, you want to build a, a sort of a, a model for that, right? You don't want to put out, you know, you're not really interested in sort of a projections model where you have five or 10 years and it shows how you have a billion dollars of revenue. That, that doesn't mean as much. But if you have a, a year or two model where you're sort of thinking about when you're going to hire, when are you going to bring people on, what's happening in terms of you know, sales, then you can actually be a little bit more precise on well, how much do you really need for that period of time to get you to those next milestones. And then you want to put in you know, a little bit of a, a buffer as well, just given the amount of time fundraising takes. So now we, we say 18 to 24 months is probably best practice, just with COVID, uncertainty, extra buffer. And if you end up not needing that much runway, then it's easier to sort of increase spending and investing in product or, or sales or whatever to sort of accelerate. Um, versus you know, needing more later if you're not quite hitting those, uh, those, those benchmarks. You don't really want to have to go back, and back to your investors and sort of say, hey, you know, we're not quite there yet. You know, it happens and it's okay, um, but ideally you try and you know, get to that, those next milestones. Uh, if, if, as you're talking to investors, everyone's telling you you're raising too much or too little, you know, if you hear that 20 times, then maybe start you know, listening and adjust your plan accordingly. Um, obviously, out of the gate, you know, it'd be great to have $10 million to play with, but, you know, you might not have quite got there yet in terms of proving out things. And uh, there's a trade-off. You know, the more you raise now, the more uh, you'll dilute yourselves. So, you know, there's some fundamental value to, you know, the, the business today, the IP, what's visible, and, you know, staggering it out over a few, a few phases will serve you better than trying to get all that capital up front. You know, if you raise $10 million and your company's only worth $5 million and you've given up two thirds of your company. We'll talk about that math a little bit later versus you know, normally just sort of staggering out is better. I try and steer people away from rolling closes. Um, so what that means is sort of just taking checks as they come in because what happens then is you, you know, if you need a million dollars to get from A to B and it takes you a few months to raise that million dollars, then what's happening is people are really investing um, 
money for you to be fundraising, right? The burn is happening, you know, especially early on, like the company is very much sort of founder centric. Maybe you've got a team of three to 10 people. And so, you know, strongly recommend if you can try and get everyone to a critical mass of money, do a close and that'll give you enough runway to get you to the next uh, phase um, versus that sort of like ongoing drip. Uh, if you raise too much, the, the, the bar will, the bar of expectations will have gone up. You know, if you've raised $5 million and you don't have much to show for it by the time you burn through it, that's actually worse than raising a million and then not quite getting, you know, where you need to be because you've not had that much capital in yet. And so people will give you a little bit more slack. Um, and really it comes down to a lot of benchmarking against your peers, you know, typically, as I said, you know, a seed round for a startup in the Midwest is typically one to $3 million, one to two often. Um, and so that seems to work out to be enough runway to hit those metrics. And so you can kind of, you know, talk to others and talk to investors and, and try and dial that in. I won't spend too much time on this. Um, there's obviously different types of investors. They all have different pros and cons. It really depends on, you know, what capital need is, like how mature your business is and sort of how scalable the business is. If it's not a really heavily VC backable, really scalable business, then you know, that friends and family money, perhaps some angel money and perhaps a, a bit small business loan might get you where you need to be. But then if you're gonna sort of really go for that venture scale opportunity, then you, you know, you'll be talking to angels, accelerators, VCs. And um, as you go along, you know, more and more uh, sources will sort of open up to you. So angels are great because they can make quick decisions. Some of them have great expertise, you know, either industry expertise or, you know, they were a founder themselves or, you know, great network, whatever it is, they're good groups, bigger check size, uh, but you know, might move a little bit slower. You might have a bit, a bit of group thing there, but again, serve a role. Super angels are great if you can find them. Um, you know, usually high net worth people, usually successful entrepreneurs, you know, cutting almost VC level checks. And then crowdfunding, I, I started off angel, on angel list, you know, they, it serves a role. Think of that as a good use to either sort of fill out your round um, because you just have a lot of you know, little investors not really invested in your success, but you know, rooting for you. Or if you're a kind of a consumer products company or something like that, where you want people out there in the world talking about your uh, product, then that, that's quite good as well. So, you know, I, I think crowdfunding, it's becoming more and more common, but it's still relatively less common, I guess, in VC backed startups. Um, accelerators are a great way to go if you are uh, you know, looking for help about fundraising. Um, you know, by the time you get through an accelerator, your, your pitch will be good, your idea will be refined and, and you'll get that sort of literally a stage almost to, to pitch to investors. And that, you know, that's a good, good way to go. And you normally you get a hundred or $150,000 along the way. Um, micro VCs, that's some down from capital. That's us. Um, you know, most VCs in the Midwest, I'd say are micro VCs, um, you know, scrappy, relatively small teams can move relatively fast. Uh, are really working for you because yeah, everyone's trying to hustle for a good track record to try and make it you know to that next fund, the bigger fund. And then institutional VCs, much bigger teams, um, you know, can be slower moving, can be a little bit more formal. Not all of them though. Some of them are, you know are, are good as well. But you have these bigger funds. They're going to have different priorities in terms of okay, well, how many, what bigger, what size check size do I need to write to really uh, you know make things move here, and. Um, yeah, like just the bigger funds, it just requires them having a different bar. Uh, strategics and corporate venture capital, make sure they're strategic for you and not just that you are strategic for them um, because otherwise you're sort of not really aligned in terms of the outcome. Um, and then venture lenders and revenue-based financing, that comes along typically more around series A type phase once you have some uh, revenues to, to lend off of. And venture lenders often look to come in alongside series A type funds as additional capital. Um, so then, uh, in terms of who to raise from, you know, if, if you're tuning in from, you know, Twin Cities, there's obviously some great local funds, they have great networks, they're gonna help you sort of find local talent and, you know, be able to sort of elevate you locally. The regional funds will have, you know, a network elsewhere. The national coastal funds, you know, they're gonna have networks, again, different. So everyone's got different networks, different types of value add, um, I always, you know, suggest people sort of build a syndicate of, you know, a few different types of investors. So you're not just relying on, you know, one fund, one type of value add, 
because if they you know suddenly go cold on you for some reason uh perhaps you, you know these personal relationships right if you, if you fall out with them or uh you know things aren't quite going as planned and they don't want to step up then you, you know you really sort of locked in with that one fund versus having a few options where you can kind of you know keep multiple doors open you know multiple networks multiple uh, folks for expertise um and so um yeah, bigger funds, not necessarily better. It's nice to have that dry powder, um, which we'll talk about here. Um, but, you know, just think about what makes sense for your business given where you're at. So in terms of what you should be looking for in, in, in investors, once you've got the round together, you'll be thinking about the next round. So, you know, do they reserve for follow on funding? How much? Um, so some series A funds will do a little bit at seed and then they're really trying to sort of put in money at the, the series A stage. And then some seed funds will reserve maybe, you know, the same check again to follow on, but then have connections with series A funds. So there's, there's different ways to sort of get to the same place, but you want to kind of have some certainty that you'll have some help in that next raise to kind of de-risk that. Uh, obviously, if you have different expertise, in, you know, depending on your sector, you can kind of figure out what, what makes the most sense for you there. If you have different networks um, and you want someone with a good reputation, right? And ultimately, this is a relationship, you know, you will hear from these people for five to 10 years, typically. Um, and, uh, you know, once the checks in, everyone's on the same team. So, you know, make sure you uh, do your diligence on the, the investors as well, the founder reference checks. And I talked about, you know, the idea of having a syndicate versus, versus a single source. Okay. Um, so if you had a few questions in advance about specific terminology, there's I mean, that could be an hour in, its, in and of itself. There's a book called Venture Deals. If you're raising a round, I highly recommend you buy it. The, the title's a little bit aggressive, be smarter than your lawyer and venture capitalist, but it does lay out all of the different elements of convertible notes, preferred equity, all, all these different instruments to get used. Um, so you can understand what all the different terms mean, what the trade-offs are. Um, Pre-money versus post-money valuations, I had a few questions about that. Think of the pre-money as the value of your business, you know, as, as you approach the investors. Um, so really, you don't have the pre-money equity valuation. And so if you don't have any debt, your equity valuation is the same as you, the value of your enterprise. So when, let's say your pre-money valuation that an investor agrees with you is sort of $8 million. When that investor puts in $2 million, the post money is then eight plus two. So, you know, you've gained an asset called $2 million of cash that sits on the balance sheet. And so the value of your company was what it was before, plus that 2 million. And so the post is 10. Um, and then over time, you'll, you'll burn through that 2 million, but hopefully that's then going into, you know, more product, more sales, um, other things, which will increase the pre-money valuation on the next round. So think of the pre-money as sort of the, uh, the ceiling going into, you know, your round, then the post money is sort of the floor for that next round after that. Okay. Um, caps and discounts. Those are convertible note terms. Uh, cap table is a capitalization um, table. That's really shows everyone sort of your, your different holdings. Um, you know, it shows you how much you own, who else has invested, you know, how much your, uh, how much your employees are incentivized through stock options, things like that. Um, there's a lot to cover. So read the book. If you're interested in safes, Google Y Combinator safe, they'll explain that. Techstars has a pretty good model, convertible note docs, and they explain that. And then for preferred equity, Series Seed and NVCA both have sort of standard docs. NVCA is often used at, um, uh, often used sort of for, for, series, for series A docs. Sorry, a question here from Carrie. Standard amount reserved for employees. Um, it varies. Typically, you see option pools sort of 10 to 20 percent. And then, you know, those get allocated over time. They typically best over four years. And then often every round that will get topped up. And so that, that's a negotiating point, um, you know, between you and the sort of lead investors in terms of, you know, how much uh, additional, you know, option pool refresh is granted. And then who's that diluting, right? Depending on when, um, depending on how this term sheet structured, that can either sort of dilute the founders on a pre-money basis or yeah, everyone on a post-money basis. So you, you're a, if you have a good attorney helping you through the docs and through the process, they'll be able to help guide you through that process. Okay, so thanks for that question. Um, so common stock 
is really what you as a founder own in a company. Don't raise off common stock. It's very unusual. Um, most sophisticated investors will, will not do it because really investors are giving you money without having any real control. And so the trade-off for that is often that you, they sort of sit ahead of you in the preference stack. So preferred stock gets paid out ahead of common stock in a liquidation. Convertible notes are senior to the common stock in a liquidation. Simple agreement for future equity, which is sort of like a convertible note, but it's not debt-like, it's more equity-like. It doesn't have a maturity, it doesn't have an interest rate. That too sort of sits ahead of you. So like, that's often the trade-off. It's like, okay, we have no real say on what you're doing here, but we're going to um, uh, you know, get that sort of downside protection in return. Um, so typically you find convertible notes and safe to use at the pre-seed rounds. Uh, they are um, relatively quick, relatively easy. They really defer the question around uh, valuation to the next round. And so the valuation cap that I referenced earlier, that's gonna be the worst case scenario for investors. So the pre-money will, will set the level at which they convert. Uh, and so if you have a, a convertible note with a $5 million cap and you raise a $10 million pre-money series A, for example, uh, you, the investors will convert at the $5 million valuation. And so because you did better than expected, like you know, they get a little bit of protection, but then on the same side of things, if things don't go to plan and you raise money at a $4 million valuation, then they will, you know, the cap is not applicable and they'll convert at actually a discount to that. So you, you see caps and discounts, if you read about convertible notes, that's really what's going on. It's just sort of a way to sort of um, kick the can down the road in terms of what everyone's actually converting at, but also incentivize people to invest now. You do sometimes see uncapped convertible notes. Again, as an investor, you know, I don't like them because I'm not really incentivized to help yet. I don't have ownership yet. I just have like the debt claim. And so I'm going to want to, uh, you know, push that, um, you know, know sort of my worst case scenario when I'm investing. Okay, a little bit behind schedule here. Sorry, I'm talking a lot. <laughs> the, um, the valuations. Uh, how do questions about these? Honestly, it's art and science. You know, you can run DCFs, discounted cash flows to sort of value the company. I've done enough of those in my lifetime. You can make those say anything. So actually investors often use those as more of like a sense check and make sure they're going to get a good return based on what they think your cash flows will do. Often it's looking at comparable deals. Um, and there's an idea that VCs don't really price um, value startups, they price ownership. Okay, so typically 20 to 30% of the round, um, you know, it, it's what they, what they target. Um, sorry, 20, 20 to 30% of your company at each stage is sort of the ownership target they, they typically look for because they'll get diluted over time by your future rounds and they want to have ownership at the end. So, you know, that's just typically what, what you see. You might see as low as 10 or 15, you might see higher than 30, but that's often the range. And it's all about really, you know, where will this get you and having an uptick from, from here to compensate for the fact that you might not make it to those uh, next next milestones, okay? Okay, so now onto the best practices bit. Um, so this is, uh, if you're familiar with Glengarry, Glen Ross, these are the, the Glengarry leads. These are the, the high value leads that you're, you're gonna wanna identify when you're, when you're fundraising. Fundraising is sales. You know, you're selling yourself, you're selling your vision, you're selling your product so far, your, your team, like your execution. So I, I often use like the sales, uh, met sort of metaphors here. So we'll talk about just building a prospect list, uh, setting up a, a basic CRM, the pitch deck, some other things you can use working on your pitch in the data room. We're covering a lot. You had lots of questions. Um, obviously, you know, if you want me to go deep on any of these, then, then let me know. Um, and uh, let's jump into it. So building a prospect list. So before you start, some people just start fundraising, right? And just start having conversations, see how they go. I don't recommend that. I think that's a bad use of time. Being deliberate up front, investing the time up front in figuring out, okay, you know, who are you really targeting? You know, if they're angels, okay, build a list of angels. So when you start having conversations, you have a bit of momentum going. If there are funds you're targeting, you're like, who are the funds? That way you can work through it more systematically, okay? So network, network, network. The best way to find people and, you know, to get introduced to people is just to keep building your network. So, you know, Things like Twin City Startup Week are great because you're really connecting with others. Obviously, it's virtual this time. You're connecting with others. Who, you know, 
interested in the same space, interested in the same geography, you know, they're going to have, everyone's going to know investors, everyone's going to have, you know, people they can introduce you to. So like really work on that. It was about fishing where the fish are. You know, if, if, if you're a uh, fintech company, go to a fintech conference, even if it's virtual, you know, you'll find out who are the investors that are seriously interested in that space. Um, you know, the, the happy hours, the meetups, like all of these things, which, you know, are still happening in some form right now, obviously that will come back. You know, you'll just get start to get a sense of like, okay, who is actually investing in our space? Who is, who's reasonably interested? Yeah, every investor you talk to or anyone that you know, you know, they can make recommendations. Talk to other founders. Who do they talk to? You know, don't have to like start from complete scratch. Like everyone's going to know at least a few investors they'd recommend to talk to. Service providers, you know, your lawyer, um, your accountants, your recruiter, you know, all these people, they know investors as well. So feel free to le leverage them. And as you're talking, everyone you're talking to can refer you to others. You know, don't be afraid to ask, you know, if it's not for them, do you know anyone else? That might be interested. Okay, that, that's a perfectly reasonable question. They can. The worst they say is no, and um, yeah, just keep doing that. And if they are interested, then they'll be incentivized to help you fill out the rounds so you can get going as well, right? Google. I, I know that's obvious, um, but you know, keyword search for especially if some of you had very specific questions around sort of niche sectors. Just find out, you know, who's investing in your space. Start building that list. Um, a lot of investors are on Twitter. You know, engage with them, see who they're interested in. Uh, you know, a lot of them have their DMs open, like LinkedIn, again, keyword searching. Like these are all ways you can find the list, angel list for angels. You know, don't necessarily reach out through angel list, but reach out through LinkedIn. I'd say I, I'm on an angel list. I don't really see the emails there. And then there is databases. They're not perfect, but if you can get access to PitchBook or Crunchbase or NFX, visible.vc just launched something. They're all directories of, of startups, right? So invest the time up front. It'll go a long way. Okay, I'm gonna talk faster. The CRM, obviously, you know, track the firm name and who you're talking to, but get, track their title, right? So a lot of the times you'll be talking to an analyst or an associate initially. Um, those are the people that are sort of, you know, dealing with that high volume of sort of, you know, initial meetings. But if they're serious, then you'll get to, you know, at least a you know, senior associate, vice president, uh, principal or managing director. So as soon as you got through them to that, now you know they're serious, right? You're talking to a decision maker. You, you can get a real sense of um, what else will be required to get them comfortable, get them over the line. Um, thanks, Jade. Yeah, I saw your comment. Yes, yes. Uh, talk, talk to a lawyer before uh, starting to raise money. That's, that's a great point. Um, yeah, careful about the rules on general solicitation. Um, so also, you know, as you get investors, or, you know, especially if you're like seed or series A stage, you know, who else knows the firms you're targeting, right? Cause they can do a warm introduction for you. They can check in, Hey, like how did the meeting go? They can back channel information, see how serious they are, see how interested they are. That's very valuable. If you're looking for a lead investor, not everyone leads around. Some of them require it. Some of them prefer it, you know, track that. And really get a sense of uh, the estimated interest level along the way, right? So you can start be prioritizing who you're talking to and have a sense of, okay, these folks typically write a $250,000 check or a million dollar check. And, you know, you'll start to get a sense of, like, are you, as you're going from like interest to sort of soft commitments to hard commitments, do you think you're going to be fully subscribed or oversubscribed? Because that's really what you're sort of targeting. Um, try and take a note on, you know, what, what else they need for timing around decision making. Uh, you know, always track next steps. You know, there's always like a, a few things which like, you know, it's going to vary by, by firm. But like, you know, what are the things that are hung up on that you need to sort of provide more data on? Track that, follow up, be really systematic. And like my, my best like founders I've invested in, you know, I had a question and within a few days I'm sent the answer. And eventually you run out of reasons to say no, okay? Um, just yeah, track when you had the last contact with them, try and keep some momentum, and then ultimately just try and prioritize, you know, who do you feel like it's a, a better fit. See the question on cold emails dip. Um, we'll get to that in a second. Um, so um, pitch deck basics. Okay, again, lots, lots to cover here. I'll, I'll be sending these deck out by the way, so don't, don't worry about taking, taking notes. 
the pitch deck, you, you really got to spend time getting it right. Now, these, these slides are terrible, right? So don't use this as the benchmark. This is something I put together real quick uh, to try and focus on the content for everyone. But, you know, invest, make it look professional, uh, get a lot of feedback on it before you really start fundraising, you know, talk to some friendlies first. And these are the things which, like, I'd say have to be in the deck. There's always other stuff you can put in. But if these aren't in it, then there's a, there's a big question to be answered, right? So what problem are you solving? Um, lay out the case for it. You know, you want the investors to sort of nod, like, yes, this is a real problem. Um, how does your solution solve it? You know, what's the value proposition? Are you nice to have or need to have? Uh, how are you different and better to what's out there already? Um, product roadmap even, you know, what's the vision beyond that? You know, it's like, okay, yeah, this is great, but, but then what? Business model, how are you gonna make money? Um, some people don't put that in. So you're left with the question, okay, well, this is great, but what are you, you know, who are you charging? How are you charging? What are you charging? Um, and then, you know, try and get a sense of unit economics. You know, if you're, uh, you know, you can estimate a lifetime value of a customer given the type of customers you're selling to, the price point you're selling at, things like that. I'm talking more again, so SaaS than med device and things like that, but hopefully, you know, just, you know, think about the unit economics of like where the capital's going, okay? Um, traction. Uh, the more things you can include that show that there's something there, like early customer logos, pipeline, you know, things like this, which is sort of showing that things are going up and to the right or will shortly after getting capital, that's great. Bring that forward, that story, show that story, make that obvious. Um, and if you have good metrics, like include them, it will vary by your business. If you don't have good metrics, try and show that they're improving. And if they're just not, then, you know, honestly, it'll, it'll be tricky to raise money because people will eventually find out in diligence. So really make sure execution is, is working here. The go to the market strategy, you know, how are you going to sell? Right? That's important. Do a little bit of work for the investors on market and competition, right? Where do you think you fit in into the world? Like, who else is out there? You know, who do you see as a competitor? And it'll show you like one, you've done your homework on your competition, but also, um, you know, as investors are sort of dealing with what, you know, make, just make it easy for them. Like, you know, you, you should know more about your business and your space than the average investor, right? Some investors will be sector specialists, but most, you know, want you to want to know that you are like really on top of it. Um, projections, you know, sometimes those are followed up with, really, it's just a sense check. You know, are you looking at, if you put in your deck that you're gonna have a billion dollars of revenue next year, loss of credibility. You know, if you have, that you're gonna be at a few million in revenue in 10 years, doesn't look like a venture scale company, right? So it's just show us where you're aiming and like how you think you're gonna get there. And that can be part of the conversation. Team, like who are they? What's their background? And then the ask as well. Okay, just keep an eye on the time here. So teaser, if you wanna send one out, that's fine. I'd say send a deck. Investors, it doesn't take long for them to skim through a 20 page deck just to get a sense of if they're interested or not. The really big decks, sometimes you get one that's like 50 or 100 slides. It's okay, it's better to kind of send it by topic, right? Video pitch, starting to get more common, but typically investors like request that, so don't necessarily make that a thing. If you have a product that you're gonna demo, do it once, record it, make it really good, send it out. Like that'll be a good use of your time versus scheduling lots of 30 minute demos with people. And then a financial model, yes. Do one, this is a debated topic, uh, early on, they don't mean much because there's so much uncertainty, but it just shows that you're thinking, what's driving your business? What's your use of capital? Where are you aiming? Will you get there? No one's going to hold you to like that, like end of year number. It's just more about the process of showing like you're being thoughtful about the use of capital. Okay. Okay. The pitch, um, there's really three pitches or four. So one, you know, if you're in a Zoom happy hour or you're at a networking event, have a really good elevator pitch and that's gonna get you that meeting, you know? Just think about, you're at a dinner party or something and someone's like, oh, what do you do? Like, make it interesting, make it a hook, be like, I'd love to learn more. That's the objective of the elevator pitch, not to just word vomit everything about yourself. The call pitch, like often you go through the slides on the call, voiceover, the slides should be standalone. People can kind of read them and make sense of them, but the, the voiceover should add something to them. Uh, hopefully like I'm doing right now. Um, and you know, it's really 
aim for about 10 minutes to get through your deck, uh, 10 to 15, because if you have a 30 minute call, that leaves enough time for Q&A along the way. And the objective of that is just to get that second meeting where you'll start to dig into certain topics. Uh, I have had some founders like actually just read their pitch. Don't do that, okay? And then the conversational pitch, you know, if, if I've already looked at your deck in advance, um, or perhaps we're, we met a, a like a speed networking thing, you know, a lot of this is like your signature, right? You know, the first time it'll be a little awkward, but over time it becomes more natural. So just practice, practice, practice. The more people you pitch, like the better. So start with friendlies, you know, then go to like low priority targets before you, you know, whoever you really want, you know, make sure you've got it all sort of smooth before then. And then the fourth kind is, is sort of like the pitch event pitch, right? So if you are on a stage and you have big slides behind you, that's a different type of pitch, right? That, that you know, it might be five minute, three minute, 10 minute format. That's more of like a, a show, right? So the energy's got to be different. The slides are different, less text. Um, so obviously for the, any event, you've got to sort of do, do the right thing there. Um, I'll skip over these because you can read them, but there are just some questions that kind of come up along the way. Like typically every, every sort of conversation or like within the first couple, just make sure you have good answers for them, okay? And then the data room. Um, some people like to have one and then share the link with everyone. That makes life easier. Others sort of start with one and then, you know, share links with people. So as people get further into diligence and you add more information for them, it's sort of custom to them. There's not a right way to do it. I think both's fine. It just depends on, on your preference in terms of how much you want to sort of keep your cards under your, close to your chest. Um, I won't go for these. You can read these. Uh, often your lawyers will know what you should put in there. If you've got investors already, you know, if you're funded, you know, they should know what you should put in there. Dropbox, Google Drive, Box is fine. I've heard lawyers recommend Box because it's more secure. I've seen Dropbox probably more than anything. And really, don't send this initially, but after that first or second meeting, once you are convinced that they are really digging in here, then you can give them everything they need, right? And then that's going to prompt more questions. And again, you'll see how, how real they are, right? If you, if you give them all the information and you don't get anything back, eh, they're probably not that interested. If you give them all the information, you get like a big questions list back, now they're really digging in. So think of this as just, you know, providing everything on a platter, make, make their life easy. Again, pr be prepared. If you, if you build these as, you, as you're sort of running your business, it's quite handy. So having all of your corporate docs and board minutes, and you know, if you have a board minutes, not everyone does that. Um, you know, customer contracts, you know, just try and keep them all organized. You know, or just spend that time up front before you start your fundraise to get it all together. Okay, we've got six minutes, um, so I'll try and get through this quick. So back to Glenn Gary and Ross. Like AIDA, attention, interest, decision, action. This is like sales or like old school marketing. It it kind of works for fundraising as well. You got to get their attention. You got to approach them. You got to get them hooked. Build interest. Assess their interest. Right. So are you wasting your time or not? And then the decision, I call it the dance or like, you know, the diligence process where it's sort of like the back and forth where you're trying to get a better sense of them and answer their questions and they're trying to get a better sense of you. Um, and then ultimately you've got to get everyone over the line, right? Action, close. So here we get to your questions dip. Um, the common complaint is that VCs only like warm intros and I'll explain why quickly. There are a lot of founders out there and you know, especially the folks that sort of, uh, you know, really actively out, uh, reaching out to people. It's just, there's a lot of noise, right? So everyone's just trying to get to where should we be spending our time today or this week or next week, right? That's, you know, the, the, the biggest thing. And so the pros to the VCs of a warm intro is that someone has actually taken the initiative to hustle their way into our network, right? If I'm a healthcare IT investor, and you are interested in the healthcare IT space, and I'm interested in the healthcare IT space, we should eventually have some overlapping connections, right? Either other investors or people that work at, you know, within the industry. Um, and if someone reaches out to me and I have like zero mutual connections on LinkedIn, I'm sort of wondering who they are, right? So it's just like, it's not a great precursor to like, you know, is this really great company? but it's just a thing that they sort of use. It does create a bit of network bias. And for founders, you know, it's, it's good because once you're, if you do take that route, you sort of elevate it in terms of trust, right? You know, if one of my founders says, hey, you should talk to so-and-so, I'm gonna do it, right? So 
use people that work for startups or overlapping to kind of get to people. Don't be transactional, you know, don't meet people or ping, ping someone you don't know on LinkedIn and say, can I get an intro? That doesn't really work. But you know, you should generally be interested in building your network into the sector where you sort of end up overlapping with people. Or if you're, you know, within Twin Cities, within the Twin Cities startup community, you'll eventually start to overlap with people, right? And then you get your warm intro routes. So here we go, the, the cold email. They can work, but if you send out to a thousand people, you know, a mail merge, dear first name, like not gonna work, okay? Because um, you've not taken the, the time to reach out to them, so why are they gonna read it? Like, you know, maybe you get lucky, but I, I know it's a numbers game, but that's just not a good approach. So one, you can always guess people's email. First name or last name, more rarely, first name dot last name, initials. Like once you have the target, try that until it works. Talk to, to mention them specifically, you know, um, these bigger firms is multiple partners, you know, find the right partner, the one that's focused on, on your actual space. You know, don't talk to the partner that's in a completely different space. You know, so show you've done your homework that they're the right person, you know, why they're the right fund like you know you're active in this space you invest in this company and we're like like that but in this space or you know whatever it is um don't send like a three-page email like a couple of paragraphs max make it compelling right all you're trying to get them to do is click open on the, the deck just get them hooked um and yeah if you can send the deck it's best practice don't send, sign, you know, ask them to sign an NDA. Like if you've got something that confidential, it shouldn't be in your deck because decks like do get circulated around by people sometimes. Um, you just don't know where they're going. So like, don't worry about NDAs. Uh, just send the deck, cold email, targeted, interesting enough to open the deck. And then um, other ways in office hours, you know, some people do that. Events and networking still happening, LinkedIn messages, Twitter engagement, like just find people where they, where they are and find other ways to get on their radar. And absolutely last resort, the contact us form, some funds look at that, like it's usually the lowest priority thing on the list, right? So if all else fails, use that, but it's not ideal. Um, is it okay to send your deck out and then the same deck to make your, yes, yes. If you send the deck out and it, it, you can use that for the pictures as well. Um, Send the deck in the first cold outreach practical. Uh, send a teaser at least. Give them some some information. Don't make it too too much friction for them to find out what you really do. Okay. Um, so, yeah, just make make sure you have something that's sort of intriguing and really that first email that deck is just to get that sort of first first meeting. Um, Okay, we're gonna go five minutes over. Sorry if you have a hard stop. Uh, as I said, we'll, we'll be recording this and, and we'll get it out um, <clears throat> to everyone uh, this afternoon, hopefully, uh, or later this evening. So, coastal investors. A lot of people are like, how do we get in front of coastal investors? It's the same process, but here's the thing. They, there's a lot of them, there's a lot of startups on the coasts. So the competition is higher, the bar is higher, the expectations are higher. So by all means do it. Uh, you know, I would say don't just focus there, you know, focus locally, regionally, nationally, you know, and coastal. Uh, the really big funds, they're just going to look through the world with different eyes. You know, they have to write a five or a $10 million check to even move the needle. They need it to be a multi-billion dollar outcome. The smaller funds, it's easier to like move the needle for them, right? So a smaller check, but it'll, it'll move the needle. So different funds will have different outcomes, different preferences. And ultimately though, it's the same process, the people, they're in all the same places I mentioned. They just have different networks. And so again, if you go deeper in, up into an industry, you'll start to reach some coastal funds in your industry. You know, be friends with your competitors, be friends with the, the folks that used to work for your competitors. You know, like there's other ways to sort of like, you know, get your tentacles into the, these networks. Um, I had questions about how do you nurture relationships? I've had people at the end of like a 20 minute, you know, speed networking session, just say, are you in? That's that's not how it works, right? You gotta, you know, build the, the network over time, sorry, the, the relationships over time. You gotta build that conviction over time. Uh, there's a guy called Mark Suster, he had the phrase, people invest in lines, not dots. Uh, first time you meet someone, that's the dot. And so the next time you, you get in front of an investor, you want the dot to start to look more like a line, right? So um, 
not, not a flat line. So you know, what's happened since, you know, new team members, new customers, new products come a long way. Boom. Right, that's the second dot. And the more dots that, you know, either the more frequently the dots or like the, the, the higher the trajectory of the dots, the more excited the investors are going to get about investing. Okay. Um, before the raise, once you meet an investor, if they're sort of interested, add them to a monthly update, right? A lot of these things takes a while. What's going on? You know, what are the challenges you face? Be transparent. We had a question about, should you be transparent? If, if you're crushing it all the time, no one's going to believe you. It doesn't build trust. If you're like, you know, here's a problem. And then by the next email, it's like, we overcame that problem. That's great because startups are full of hurdles to overcome. And if you're showing them that you're identifying them and dealing with them, that's execution. Um, the highest priority funds, just try and catch up in person. Uh, but the monthly updates is, is like a nice, efficient way to do that. Put in asks. You need an intro to a customer or an investor. Um, you're looking for a hire. Put it in the email. Right? The people who are really interested will, uh, you know, reach out for you. Uh, reach out to you. Not every time, but again, if you have enough investors on the list, you know who's actually sort of engaging and trying to be helpful. Okay. And then after the raise, don't stop. Right? Some people, the communication stop, and then 12 months later, you're like, I need more money. Doesn't build confidence, right? You, you got to you know, keep being transparent along the way. Send out updates. Doesn't have to be the full updates with full financials if they're not a major investor. But be caught, be transparent. Put in asks. Try and catch up with like you know your deeper pocketed investors along the way or your helpful investors along the way, because they're on your team once they put the check in. So like make use of them. So hopefully that, that helps. Um, okay, two minutes. So uh, along the way, you're trying to assess interest. So if you get a fast yes in that first meeting, that's a little suspicious, right? I've heard, I've heard it happen. Those are normally funds you want to do a bit more work on, right? Because they're just trying to sort of get into deals. Like it's going to be really tempting, but just do a little bit of homework on like, you know, why are they being so aggressive? Um, fast no obviously is great because then you can cross people off the list and move on. It doesn't often work that way, right? Some, if it's a no, great. If you can get to that, great. If it, they seem sort of interested, it's more of a, sliding scale of conviction where people will get more comfortable over time. So again, like now you're on that sort of lines and dots theme where you've got to try and get, you know, enough conviction there that people will get over the line. Um, and so, that, you know, sorry for the time here, but you can, you know, ask these questions along the way or things you can ask yourself to assess how interested the investors are and focus your time on the most interested investors. Okay. Diligence process. Um, there is no typical diligence process. Everyone runs it in a slightly different order. Everyone that puts different weight on different things. Um, you know, all of these, I think, are commonly done just to different extents. Financial diligence, some people, you know, might be going through your bank account and your credit card, you know, to make sure like there's nothing funky going on. Others will just ask for, you know, your projections and like, don't worry about it. So everyone has different preferences. Um, the full legal diligence normally comes once you have a lead investor. It's expensive. They'll go through all your corporate docs, correct any errors, things like that. Um, but everything else is sort of more commercial. So just understanding like the products and we all do a lot of technical diligence. Some do very little. Some want to talk to one or two customers, or all of your customers. Some of them will just happily talk to someone that's talked to your customers. Okay. So again, it, it varies a lot. Um, okay. Almost there. So, always be closing. So you've got to ultimately get people over the line, right? So you're having conversations, you think they're interested, you need to, you know, try and get a number from them, right? Get a soft commitment. You know, what's your typical check size? You know, you know do you think you'll be in for that? Okay. Shall I pencil you in for that? And then you start to sort of build your list of investors. And ultimately there'll be some point where you have enough and you're like, okay, we're there. Now you need hard commitments. That's when people are like, you know, signing on the dotted line, you know, funding next week. But really, you know, before you sort of do the full doc, you, you kind of got to get like that confidence that it's coming together. Don't use fake deadlines. I've had people reach out to me and say, we're closing around at the end of the month. Like maybe, you know, it, it's going to be when you have got that point where you have enough soft to hard commitments that you feel confident that you'll, you can close. Um, let the investor, lead investor lead. Um, you know, they can help you bring rounds, uh, other investors in, but don't rely on them, right? Bring other people to the table as well, other folks you want to be involved. And it, it's really, you know, just keep eliminating outstanding reservations until they have no more reason to say no. Try and create, you know, pace it to create momentum. 
And I'll leave you with a couple of thoughts here. So one, it's not about your idea. It's about execution, right? 80% of the ideas that we see are interesting. Not everything's a venture scalable business or like, you know, super high conviction. Uh, it's all about the execution. And, you know, I forget the original source of this, but the, the idea is that you can take a, you know, a me mediocre idea, but if you execute it really well, then you start a valuable business. So as much as fundraising, there's some tricks to sort of optimizing the outcome. It's the execution that will actually make it happen. Okay. And so like panel to a slide here, the, 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 the dream is FOMO, right? These rounds, these big rounds, these hot rounds with big investors, you know, what's happened there is really the investors have high conviction of outstanding execution. The founders have done a really good job with that. And they have either a lot of investors interested or have some really strong relationships. And so things which look like they happened overnight probably have been in the works for a while. And if you're in that FOMO zone, you're going to have a hot round, big round, good valuation. If you're not quite there on either the number of relationships, you know, or like amount of interest and your conviction's okay, you'll get your round done and that's okay. Right? Like close your round, start executing again. And then, but if you're not quite there on the execution side, probably don't fundraise right now. Like I, it's a case of having to do more with less, but get your ship in order because the more compelling the story is, um, and the, the more it's in order when you go along the way, like the easier the round will come together. So a few closing thoughts, fundraising and sales. I've said this again, you know, it's not, it's that first impression. It's that ongoing impression, build a relationship over time, make it easy for them to figure out what you're doing, make it easy for them to find you. If they're looking for you, make it obvious why what you're doing is interesting. Um, it's all about building confidence in, in you and your execution. Um, be patient with people. It does take a while for people to run through their processes. You, know, you really, your job is to be like the top two or three most interesting thing, maybe top 10 most interesting thing they're working on to get them over the line, right? Because people have a lot of things to promote them. Um, and yeah, so that's, that's it. I know I'm, I'm sorry I went over time. We had a ton to cover. I went really quickly. Um, I'll send out a uh, feedback form after this. We'd love your feedback. If there's any other topics that you would like us to go deeper on, do another one of these some other time. Uh, there's an additional comment section at the bottom. Uh, connect with us uh, here. And um, yeah, thanks. Thanks again. Screenshot this before I cut it off if you're trying to get in touch. And uh, thanks for joining. Hope you enjoy the rest of Twin Cities Solid Week. And uh, if you're on the Midwest Tech Connect side, hopefully see you at the, the networking in about half an hour. All right. Thanks very much. Bye.